Dave Starman now joins us on the show. Dave, thank you so much for coming on. Looking like you are in a much warmer spot than we are up here in Minnesota. How's it going? Oh, it's it's going great. We are uh, we are in Fort Lauderdale. Our our son just played in the ECEL All Star Game and playoffs uh, this past weekend in Palm Beach, and the league offices in Palm Beach bless their hearts. So we're in, we decided instead of going from New, uh, Florida to New York and then to Grand Forks over a span of 48 hours, we would just take advantage of a couple of days of vacation and uh, we'll do our coaches conference calls from down here. I know we just made Pat Pershwell very jealous because we made sure that we set up the camera to look at the palm trees in the background. So we had some fun with that. And I'm sure with Bradbury tomorrow, we'll get some more laughs out of this. And, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's been a good couple of days and yeah, it is 85 and beautiful. Not adding insult to injury at all with that. Here, there's a foot of snow outside and maybe pushing 20 degrees. So not not jealous at all over here. But, but spring, you know, you're is, a busy spring guy. is not far. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. You're a busy guy. You got to squeeze in your vacation time when you can. And speaking right. of being busy, just one of the things that you do in addition to all of the awesome work that you do within the hockey realm is you also have been on the broadcast crew for World Juniors. Unfortunately, it had to get canceled just a couple months ago, but the good news coming out last week is it's rescheduled for August. How excited is are you for this to still be continuing to go on, that there's news that it's going to happen still, and just how big of a deal is it that they're working to make this work again? I think it's great. I, I have often said that I think the World Juniors is the greatest amateur tournament going. I, I think it's it's more unique than the Memorial Cup or the Frozen Four. I mean, those are great tournaments, but the, to me, the World Junior Tournament is special. It's the international flavor. It's the best players in the birth year for you know each country that's coming in. And, and I, here's the thing. I do think that there are ways that we can make the World Juniors even better, which I would be a whole different sideline topic. But I, I'm thrilled that they got this thing rescheduled. My biggest worry right now is with the timing and where it's going to – the time of year it's going to be held – that's going to be just in front of some NHL development camps. And my thought process in hearing a little scuttlebutt going on is with some of the players that would have been involved in the world juniors to come back for certain countries, they may be under NHL contract by then. And their NHL teams may be saying, well, wait a minute, we want our guys to to our development camp and we want our guys coming to our main training camp to make our team and are probably going to make our team. So in, in that respect, we're not sure that we're going to let them go. Or we're going to let them play. So I think that, one of the unique challenges of putting this world junior together is going to be who plays and you might see some of the underage players in each of these countries wind up on some of these rosters as opposed to the players that wanted originally because of the fact that you could have some NHL conflict. So I, I, I do think that it's some drama. I do think it had some excitement and we'll, we'll see how these rosters actually shake out, but here's the bottom line. When they play it, if they play it, wherever they play it, it's still going to be, the greatest amateur tournament that gets played. Well, I agree with you 100% on that. But even going off what you just said about how, you know, some of these rosters might change up a little bit with the development camp, it was said that they now can change the team up as well. How much do you think, just if you had to guess at this point, do you expect these to change up? I would tell you this. If, if I played at the national program where I played in the USHL last year and I was a pretty good player, I'd be really excited about how this looks because I do think that the U.S. could wind up with a, a bit of an underage roster potentially, and I do think that opens up the door for some early matriculation of a lot of these kids that eventually would have been on the team to get one more year in. So we may wind up in a scenario where some of these U.S. kids are playing a third world junior tournament because of the fact that they made the team either in their draft year or maybe even before their draft year, just depending on what the depth looks like. And I think that's great for their development, not only as NCAA players down the road, but as NHL players. I think Team Canada is going to face the same deal. I think the Euro is going to face the same deal. And as we've noticed in some of these European countries, they don't mind going a little younger. And I think it, I think it opens the door to a very unique tournament. And based on what we've come out of with, with players getting extra years, whether they play prep hockey, play in the North American League, play in the USHL, play in the NCAA, I just think the map is all over the place for where players are playing and when. And that, that to me, will be a case study moving forward as to what we might be able to do later on as the dynamics of age grouping changes. For sure. And even rewinding a little bit to about two months ago when 
this tournament was initially started, what were some of your observations or things that you were seeing from the players and just from the games themselves before it ultimately was canceled? I think the best thing about this tournament is the different styles of play that each team brings in. And you know, I'll go back to last year's tournament for a second, not, not the one that was canceled, but the one before it. The, the, so the Soviets, the Russians came in, I think Soviets, because you've Lariano coach, and it's February 22nd, happy, you know, happy 4-3 day. But it, I think back to the way that Lariano had that team playing, and they were playing like the old Soviet teams of the 80s. There was a very puck control possession, kind of like soccer, where they didn't mind if they took 20 shots, but there were going to be 20 good ones, and there's a ton of passing and a ton of regrouping. And for a couple of games, including the game where they beat the U.S., it worked. And then everybody figured it out, and and it didn't work. And then the game against the Slow Watch. The Slow Watch are very unique in their forecheck because they love to throw a guy behind the net to try to break up that, that D-to-D pass when play went below the goal line to and, and disrupt in a lot of different ways. So you see you see some styles that you don't necessarily see at the NCAA level. You see some styles you don't see at the USHL level you, or, or even the even the pro level. And that's why I think the, the U.S. – I think the, the World Junior Tournament is great because these players get exposed to a lot of different dynamics and the coaches as well – that very quickly through video and not a lot of practice time, they've got to come up with answers for it. To me, that is a wonderful aspect of player development. For sure. And taking things to a little bit more of a personal level, like we had mentioned, you've been fortunate enough to be a part of a number of world juniors for the coverage of them. What is the most fun part of doing that for you? You know what, that's a, that's a great question. I got to tell you, the worst part about it is, is obviously being away from my family for all those years and, and I know the coaches have said that too. I mean, that, that's the tough part because it's a special time of year when, when you're away. But the, the, the nice part about it is a couple of things. Number one is it becomes a hockey think tank for about three weeks where you are really locked into some great discussions with some great hockey people, whether it be the coaching staff of, of our team in the U.S., whether it be some of the other broadcast teams. It's, it's been great to spend so many winners with Dennis Bayak and and. Craig Button and talk hockey with those guys or whether if we're on the other side with with first it was Pierre Maguire now Ray Ferraro and, and Gordy Miller and be able to exchange ideas with those guys so I, I think the, and obviously all the scouts are there the assistant general managers and GMs and and for a lot of those years I was scouting for two different teams Montreal and Toronto so it's been it's been great to interact with so many elite hockey minds and to be able to watch such good players and such good structure and such good system play and to me it it's just it's an edu- it's a million dollar education that you're getting paid for and and obviously you're getting the challenge of, of doing the games and, and trying to be entertaining for the u.s fan base well you do a great job of it so a lot of credit to you Thank there you. And again you're a very busy guy not to mention with all of the freelance jobs that you do such as world juniors you are now currently in PBS Sports Network for NCHC coverage. How has that been going so far? Oh, I'll tell you what. The, the CBS, uh, CBS NCHC deal has been so incredibly unique. And I know CBS Sports has, has a lot of properties, whether it's pro properties, college properties, and a lot of great deals in place. But this one has become very unique for us because we have really become like a family with the NCHC. And... You know, we both understand the dynamic here. We are, we are certainly out to sell the programs and make these programs look good and tell the great stories. And, you know, the NCHC realized that the, the reach that we have and the, our ability to help them out. So it's become, how can we help each other? And the friendships that have been built, the, the, we've been together a long time doing this now. Like, we're about a decade into this. And, you know, the network itself is 19 years into this. And, you know, I know coaches that were young and single and now are married with kids that are, you know, playing 12U and to be able to watch our children grow up and exchange stories and meet up on the road. And that, that has been the, the best part of, of a lot of this. But in terms of the hockey component, I think that we were looked at from day one when we were back when we were CSTV, and this is 2003, 2004. We were kind of looked at as the Monday night football of the network. You know, leave hockey alone. It's a weekly package. They're one night a week. They've got good people doing it. And just let them do their thing. And then when CBS bought the network, we were kind of in that same boat. A lot of credit goes to Ross Malloy, who, who was really overseeing hockey and created this unique package that is now 19 years old. And we're still kind of that way, too, at the network. So even though we're part of this humongous conglomerate, and, and yes, we're a small part of it, an 11-game-a-year package, 
the network has got a lot of respect for what we do because they know that we're dialed in. They know that we treat this like it is the gold standard. And all we want to do is go out there and be as good a broadcast as any of the NHL network shows that are out there. I don't mean NHL network. I mean, like any network that are televised in the NHL. We want to be as good a broadcast as the ones that are doing NHL games nationally. And there are times where we really feel like we are. Well, you guys definitely are. And I've been fortunate enough to see it firsthand. You mentioned the NCHC family. Me as a little sophomore at St. Cloud State in college, that's how I got to meet you, Shireen, Ben Holden. So you guys have been nothing but fantastic and you do such great work too. So again, kudos to you and the whole CBS crew. And one final question I want to ask you too, just being kind of right now in pretty much full swing college hockey, what are your thoughts on this season and who do you expect to see down the stretch? That's a good question. And you know, before that, I want to thank you for, for the kind words. And a secondary part of that is when we talk about this big NCHC family, like this is what we mean. So I, I guarantee you when we first started out, <laughs> you, know, you were probably in grade school. We got a chance to, to deal with so many of, of you uh, like between yourself and your college and Husky Productions and people around the league, whether it be, you know, in our days at Hockey East and ECAC, we've been able to incorporate so many people into our group, which we love to do. And to be able to watch all of you go out and have your careers, like we love that component of it. To me, that's what has made me so special because our big family has grown and it's grown through everybody that we've interacted with in all these two schools. So the fact that you're doing well, the fact that Katie's doing well, the fact that Taylor's doing well, and, and, and there are others that down the road we can't wait to, to help out and guide. Like, it's just been a huge part of us. And it's being like a secondary parent almost. So uh, good for you guys for, for jumping on board with us. But uh, when we look at the, the NCAA for this year, I got to tell you, I still think Denver's the best team in the country. And I'm lucky because I get to see a lot of different teams. And all the servers I'm linked into, I get to watch everybody. And uh, there are a lot of really good teams out there. Minnesota State is a really, really good team. Winnipeg is a really, really good team. Uh, Denver, to me, is a little different. They're a little deeper. I think that they're going up every week against the big boys. Like There's just no dive in their schedule. Every week they're playing somebody else is in the top 10, whether it be Duluth or North Dakota or St. Cloud State. And, and I think that puts them over the edge just a little bit in terms of, of who the best team is. So I think we'll see them in Boston. I know that Minnesota Duluth is a really good team. I think that they've got a chance to get themselves to Boston too if, if they can get healthy. Uh, North Dakota, Bradbury, the job that he has done has been unbelievable with the fact that he's had no lineup and he lost 14 players to – mostly the NHL deals. The job he's done is unreal. I know Brett Larson and the St. Cloud State group are fighting through some adversity right now. And, you know, they've been had guys in and out of the lineup too. I think they're, they're due for a rebound. And what a job Pat first in the West Michigan has done with, with that team. There's one draft pick on that team and they're playing with the big boys every night. So who gets to Boston? I, I think Denver does for sure. I got to tell you, I think Boston's has got enough to get themselves to Boston also. And how special would it be for UMass to, to play a Frozen Four in the state of Massachusetts, defending champions. I really like the way Quinnipiac plays. They defend so hard. They are so structured. And they're not robotically structured. They're just smart structured. And I love what Red Pecknell does with his team. So I think those are some teams to keep an eye on. Who's the team that comes out of nowhere? Minnesota, to me, is a great team. I, I think they're going to be a boatload to handle as, as they go through the playoffs. Michigan, obviously, has got great players. We'll see what they do as a team with so many of their guys potentially 48 hours away from playing in the NHL. So I think those are the, the groups that we look at, but you know as well as I do, there's going to be some four that's going to pick off a one and all of a sudden we got a great Cinderella story coming to Boston. Oh yeah, I, we've had some experience with that firsthand, so I know exactly what yes, you're talking you about. I'm, I'm thinking of AIC when they upset St. Cloud State, so painful a few that was years so ago. tough for me because oh i know that was so hard for me in a lot of ways because one that st cloud state team I, those kids were great i got really close with that team i love that group i really thought that they were destined for for something wonderful and and it was it was tough to watch them lose but the head coach at aic is eric lang and eric played for me in junior so like that was a hard game to watch and that's one of the hardest parts about what we do is we don't root for anybody team wise we root for the people we really like that was a hard game to watch because there were just a lot of people we cared about in that game. And it was hard to see St. Cloud lose because we just knew they were destined for something special. They got through game one. Yeah, uh, I can imagine from your end and from my end too, being a student there working for the program, 
very painful, but you know, hoping St. Cloud State can make their way back to the Frozen Four and hopefully come away with their first <laughs> championship. We're keeping hope out for that. Dave, thank right. you so much again for taking time out of paradise to come on this week's show. I think I'll see you next at the NCHC Frozen Faceoff in St. Paul. So I'm looking forward to that and we'll have to come say hi. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for what you do. Shereen and I love all the coverage that you guys give to the NCHC, the Big Ten, the CCHA. Keep up the good work over there. Thank you so much, Dave.